everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Guys, I am so privileged at this very moment because I stumbled on a vast trove of vintage equipment and people are allowing me to go forth and make videos based on where we've gone as a career field. And that takes me all the way back to the very beginning. We got to figure around about the 1980s 1970s 1980s that's when some of this equipment herald from and so i mean this comes from a long way back guys and i found all this stuff holy cow here we go um so this right here as you can guess from the the label is an electro surgery analyzer and it comes in a laminated box seems to be pretty durable it's got some perforations and those are vent holes. It's got a standoff right here so it can be at an elevated position and that's the position I'm gonna have it in. So you guys can take a look and see what a vintage electro surge analyzer looks like. So let's go ahead and get to it. Here you go. In fact, here's something. I can take the lid off so let's Go ahead and take the lid off for a moment and take a look at what we got going on underneath the lid. All right, so there is a uh, biotech instruments label up inside it. I have a set of leads. Check these guys out. Banana plugs at one end. God, nothing much has changed. Woo. I'll tell you what, I just, I think I just about cut myself on these guys right here. <sighs> guys, I guess the, uh, days of leaving sharp tags on zip ties that's that's been going on for decades huh that's annoying anyway let's see we got oh what do we get this is so weird all right so i got some vintage clips those are these are some of the best clips too guys i really do dig these ones they're so easy to use and they never broke they never broke this style clip right here they break you know they bend they do all sorts of stuff I love these ones. All right, and let's see, I've got these two right here. You can tell that this guy has definitely had better days. It looks a little bit corroded. So that's my leads. How crazy, all right. Well, they're durable, I'll give them that. All right, so let's put these off to the side. I have a manual and, uh oh what the heck, and a Pen, <laughs> a pen that's floating around. Oh no, wait, there's more. Oh wait, there's more. We have some of these vintage notes. Take a look at that. All right, step-by-step <laughs> -step instructions. All right, I dig that. I might actually need that, who knows. And a bag, you know what they say about bags there. Oh, it's iffy. Oh, the days of vintage electronics when you had extra fuses because they might have actually just popped because it's a Tuesday. That's not how electronics are anymore, guys. If a fuse pops nowadays, there's a reason to it. So, I'm gonna stuff that guy back in there. Oh, I can tell this guy hasn't been opened up in probably a decade or so. And let's see, what do we got? Uh, testing coag, uh, I got a check out procedure for force triad, okay. So this thing has been used way more frequently than I expected. The, the, the force triad has been around for a while, but come on, an analog meter? Wow, I can't believe somebody was using this guy to actually calibrate a force triad, which is a ligature or vein sealing, kind of a modern ESU. Um, okay, well, let's get right into it. Here's the, here's the manual. And don't you guys remember and kind of long for the days where you actually had a real manual? I've got calibration service information, a schematic for what's inside the box. How cool is that? Um, Biotech Industries. Hmm. Oh boy, here we go. This manual is from 12-4-1989. All right. Not saying that's how old this is, but I bet you it's pretty darn close. And let's see. I've got some scales written out inside. Some somebody's notes. Okay. Okay. And schematics. So if this guy doesn't work, I have a schematic. I can get it back up and going. How cool is this? Um. All right, all right. 
I got some charts, power to current conversion. Okay. I guess this one here, you might actually need that. Um, all right. Heavy load test. All right. If, if I need any questions answered, I'll refer back to this manual. Let's get to the, the meat and taters of this. That is the analog <sighs> electrosurgery analyzer. All right. And here's an infamous fuse that I was talking about. I have a button, the push for REM test. Wonder what that does, push for REM test. Very cool. I've got four banana plugs that meets up with what we had on the probes I pulled out. I've got a um, active electrode. Okay, so uh, I see. The label corresponds to the port above it. All right. So this is my oscilloscope output. Um, pretty proper. Uh, push for zero to 50 kilohertz response. Huh. Can't say I've ever had to do that. I wonder what that's for. You can see somebody wrote in here that Aspen 500 ohm. Don't really know what the heck that's about. And somebody else wrote over here. It said, it looks like it's a different, um, different penmanship. So this thing's got years of people just writing garbage right on the face. Oh, the days of not respecting your test equipment. I guess we're not past that, huh? Over here, we got some rotary dials, and they have nice, firm clickety clacks. It goes return, fault, active electrode, patient plate, and chassis. Holy cow. And that's under RF leakage. Leakage. Okay. So we're measuring leakage on this side. Interesting. Okay. And down here at the bottom, I've got a return, fault, active electrode. You press that over and you create a return fault. Huh. Interesting. I'll have to pull out one of my old ESUs and actually show you guys how to use this guy. And open circuit RF leakage. So I guess back in the day when you were running um, your circuit, you would open it up to see if you got an alarm on your ESU, I take it. And over here, this would be our load resistors. And it shows us the maximum watts. So we got 500 watts. Um, we get 300 watts. We got 300 watts, 300, 150. Okay, so we got uh, load ohms. So let's say um, most vintage units run at 300 ohms. So I guess I would have to set it at 300. And, you know, uh, a lot of our bipolars run at 100 or 50 ohms. So, I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, guys. These are a lot of the settings that I would use, except 150. You know, um, some units use 150 for uh, our load resistors. But 300, this right here is probably going to be where most of my settings are going to be. 300 or 100. And I... I have to admit, I, I do like the the uh, dual wing clickety clacks because it's way easier to switch, you know, if you're doing a lot of tests. Um, and then we got 400 and 500 ohm loads. Zero to 50 kilohertz response. I don't really know what the heck that is. I don't really know. So here's my patient return. So basically you can see what's going on here is your meter is coming through so here's your patient return patient plate that's weird that's weird all right don't completely know how to read this um i've been a biomed for 20 years and i i kind of get what some of this is ground that's obviously for doing leakage um and you're going to be checking that in milliamps which is the red scale down at the bottom watts is at the top scale and watts, you would be going from, I would assume, the patient plate to your active electrode across the meter. You see that? That's what I would assume. And for REM test, I wonder if you go from patient plate to patient plate, and then you depress this, and it, and it probably switches from active electrode to patient plate. Hmm. Not really sure. That's that's really interesting. I'll have to. I guess I'll have to read the manual after all. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and see what's inside this bad boy. Because what good is it to go over some vintage electronics without opening it up? Of course we're gonna open it up. Come on, guys. 
Of course. Plus, am I really going to hook this up to an ESU without making sure that it didn't previously have a fire? <laughs> not a chance. My homeowner's insurance here would probably not appreciate that if I caught fire to my garage. All right, here we go. And now is the challenge of how to access the, the front panel. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So I just used two thumbs right here on the top. Come on, come on. Oh, this is gonna be so cool. Here, let me get the case. The case is reasonably well built. Smells vintage, that's for sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna set that right back here. And this is gonna be a cool opportunity for you guys to see what is inside an ESU analyzer. Okay, so one of the things that is in every ESU analyzer, including the modern ones, are your load resistors or power resistors. And these ones here, you can see, are going to be linked in series or parallel based on your front dial positions. Ah. And let's see, I do have some other power resistors underneath. Wow, what a sandwich. Can you guys see that? What a sandwich. And let's see. Okay. I have a uh, bimetallic thermal disconnector right here. And what happens here is when there's a certain amount of current through this area right here, instead of having a fuse, it actually is a bimetallic. So as they heat up, one of them is going to bend away. And this guy right here is actually a safety mechanism. You can see the two, they're kind of overlapping like this right there. And um, it's current through this wire right here. I wonder what it's rated as. What a cool idea. So it's, it's like this, and then as it heats up, the because it's bimetallic, um, metals will expand when they're heated up at different rates. So what you get is um, one side is gonna be one type of metal and the bottom side is gonna be a different type of metal. And um, that one there is going to curl because you know one is going to expand faster than the other. And uh, that's what creates the disconnect, just like a switch. All right, it's basically a resettable fuse. As it cools down, they'll come back down and come into contact, and you're back in business. Um, I guess as a safety mechanism, to make sure that people don't blow this guy up, <laughs> I guess. Um, some hefty, hefty micro switches. All right, let's just call them switches because these are vintage, not really micro switches. Well, yeah, they are, but wow, they're beasts. Um, lots of power resistors in there. Very cool. And you can see the back side of my meter. And there's also some large resistors there. And you can see our calibration pot right here. So that would be how we would adjust our meter. Um, that would be probably for gain. So you're adjusting uh, the gain on this meter. But also, the, a lot of these vintage meters had another adjustment someplace else. But I can see that that's what they want. Now, all these solder jobs look fantastic. They look really durable. They're using a silicone jacketed wiring. And um, this looks like it was made really well. These resistors are all being held in by brackets. So all you'd have to do is desolder them and pop it out. And you can change out your resistor if something ever did happen. But these are beastie guys. So it's a 1% resistor and it says 50 ohm, 88 ohm, 21 ohm, 91 ohm, and 105 ohm. Sound like some really odd <laughs> resistances, but you know when you put them in series or parallel, you can get some pretty regular figures. But uh, yeah, take a look at the craftsmanship on this. The guys that put these together did an absolute fantastic job. They used second to none materials, silicone wires, they can handle high voltages and uh, obviously um, did a really nice job on all those. Let's see, I have, oh, very cool. 
So I was wondering how they attenuated the signal for this oscilloscope. You can see right here my active electrode and the wire comes in from the center pole, the RF of the coax, comes in and it's a coil that they wrapped around your active electrode. You see that? And then it goes back to the shielding, which is the outer part of your BNC connector. Um, how cool is that? So there is no direct connection, which saves your meter because one conductor will go ahead and create an electric field in another conductor. So basically it's like a little transformer right there, um, which is really cool because you're isolated from your active electrode. So it, what it's going to do is based on the amount of windings, it's going to be how strong your readout is for your oscilloscope. So if you got like 100 watts coming in here, you might only have like 0.1 of a watt, you know, worth of um, attenuation here on the scope. Very cool. Well, guys, um, we got some hardboard in there, some really large clickety clacks. I love these rotary encoders from back in the day. They got all these taps around the body and the, the wires will all screw in um, around the clickety clack. I've almost never seen those guys break. It's definitely a better way of building things, but uh, I guess in modern day electronics, nobody wants to build things like that anymore. Plus, can you imagine how expensive this guy probably was to assemble? I mean, I'm pretty good at assembling electronics and I can say that this guy, it appears to be a cluster, but it's a beautiful mess. It's a beautiful mess because wires are as short as possible. They are perfect length. Like every single wire is the absolute perfect length. There's a little bit of strain relief at every single connection and they are just the perfect length. I mean, here's a perfect example. You got one tab here, one tab up here, the wire is within millimeters of what it needs to be. This one here is maybe a little bit longer, but everything is just so neatly put together in a tight little package, beautiful construction. And I bet you this guy works to this very day. So anyway, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and put this guy back together. I will connect it up to an ESU in a future video. And let's go ahead and do some burns and let's see how this guy really performs because I bet you since it's completely analog that it functions perfectly. Anyway guys, that's all I got for you today. I figure I've taken enough of your time. This is just one of like a dozen vintage electronics that we are gonna open up, we're gonna take a look at and we're gonna explore Biomed of yesteryear. So thanks for watching guys. Hope you like these vintage Biomed videos. I got plenty more of them coming up.